You're listening to Veterans of Color, a podcast that dives into the cultural and historical realities of people of color within the United States military. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran and independent military culture researcher at Columbia University, as he explores the rich contributions, complexities, paradoxes, and challenges of these extraordinary individuals and events often forgotten in military history. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Veterans of Color, VOC. This is a podcast that deals with the contributions of people of color in the United States military, their daily lives, their lived experiences, histories, different cultural challenges and triumphs, on this show, we don't look at the veteran-civilian divide. We don't look at all the different divisions in our country at this time, but we try to look at understanding the different journeys that folks have had in and out of uniform. And so today, we are pleased to have Dr. Geraldine C., a retired professor emeritus from Florida A&M University and a scholar, a deeply regarded scholar in regards to many different areas. But I would say today we focus on the Lido Road and welcome Dr. C. Thank you. So happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. And I was just wondering, I'm a bit incomplete, much like other things in my life, but I was just wondering, can you complete us with some of your background? Sure. I was brought, born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and from uh, that experience, I became kind of a library geek. I really like libraries. <laughs> so moving into a doctorate program was nirvana for me, because I could just like puff around in the library all day. I didn't have to work. And so it was a really exciting time. So uh, my interest at the doctoral level was to uh, take a look at how the country moved from uh, a civil war posture, freeing slaves, into a Jim Crow posture. And I wanted to use uh, American literature to take a look at how the country changed its mind and was so comfortable moving into a Jim Crow kind of world. So my dissertation had to do with what I call the literature of Jim Crow call and response. And just as the TV now helps us see life in a different way, uh, literature did the same thing at the turn of the century. The difference was that for every uh, pro a Jim Crow book, of which there were many, there was always an African-American response where the storyline was flipped to uh, reflect uh, how Jim Crow affected people, how it affected their uh, worldviews, how they were convinced to move from one thing to the other, and, and then just kind of that dialogue back and forth across the color line. So that led me into other kinds of um, discoveries of and, you know, re research is almost like a puzzle, like a mystery. <laughs> and you just <laughs> keep going at it until you get to uh, the answer what my professors used to say, so what? Mm. And when you get to that point, you know you've done pretty much all the work that you can. You know, what difference does it make is, is, is the thing. The work that you're doing, what difference is it going to make? If it's not going to make any difference, you probably don't want to do it. So when it's time to research and you've answered the question, so what, you're pretty much done mm -hmm. with that particular line of investigation. So that's kind of where uh, I was. My question was uh, for myself, my individual question, having grown up in Jim Crow in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any memory of it. Mm -hmm. I don't have any experiences that would have led me to think that there was a Jim Crow world at all. Uh, so I was practically in college before I really understood the lay of the land. I just had, didn't. And I was wondering, you know, well, how how is that possible 
for a person to grow up in the midst of Jim Crow and actually not know anything about it and have mm -hmm. no memories of it. And it, it drew me to the adults that surrounded me and the hits they must have taken on my behalf mm -hmm. because keeping that kind of thing away from a kid seems to be, uh, at this day and age anyway, an impossible task, but nobody ever talked about it. Uh, nobody ever put me in a position where I would ever come in contact with it. So being able to grow up without any memory of it seemed really freeing. And I just wanted to take a look at who those people were, these adults. So when my mother passed, uh, her very good friend called to see how I was doing and et cetera. I had moved to Florida by this time. And I was chatting with her on the phone and she was still in Pittsburgh. And this was 97. And I said, you know, uh, her name was Lil the Same. She was a nurse. My mom was a nurse. She was a nurse, all the nurses. Uh, and I mentioned to her, I said, Miss the Same, she was also my godmother. So I'm, I knew her all, all my life. So I said, yeah, my mom Mom said you were a, na uh, a nurse in the army, an army nurse. She said, yeah, I was an army nurse. I said, well, where did you serve? To Gap, Burma. I'm like, what? <laughs> a hair on the back of my neck stood up because I'd never heard of soldiers, our soldiers being in Burma. I said, what, what, what were you doing there? I was with the 335th Station Hospital. There were two black hospitals. One was the 35th and there was another one. She was in Tagap. And that's where they brought the folks who had pretty serious injuries. Um, it was a full-fledged kind of uh, operating situation. She was a nurse anesthetist. I said, well, what were you doing over there? What was the army doing over there? She said, building a road. I said, building a road. What do you mean? And so we just chatted back and forth and back and forth for like an hour or two. I said, well, do you know any other soldiers? She said, sure. A bunch of them here in Pittsburgh. I'm like, okay, well, I'm coming up there <laughs> and we're going to have to talk. So she mm -hmm. was my first informant. She gave me the names of many, many, many soldiers uh, who I was able to track down because she could pick up the phone and call them. When you track them down, let me ask you this, because you are um, fascinating on many levels in regards to your academic interests, in regards to literature. And then, you know, next thing I'm I'm hearing and <laughs> what I've read about you, you know, the, the whole thing about or like. What did you did you pursue histories with these um uh troops? Yeah, oh, a, wow. uh -huh. Well, yeah, I'm a new historicist, so that's about how people maintain power using literature to do so. So um, can you say a little bit uh, of that for for the audience? Because um I find this quite intriguing. Well, I'm an English major. Mm -hmm. So there are all these different um avenues to search out. Uh, what the text is actually trying to do and say. Mm. Many, many different, you know, theories, theoretical approaches. So the new historicist was was my way because of my interest in history, but also what effect uh, does literature have on uh, the public or the reader? What, you know, what is it that, and so this concept then of maintaining power was exactly what I needed for the the Jim Crow side of this thing. How, what, what um, what philosophies are being pursued? Uh, how are they portrayed? So I took a course with Sam Proctor, who was like the eminent oral history person at University of Florida. I was at UF. Mm -hmm. So I took a couple of classes with him, which gave me uh, kind of the format of what you have to do, how's it, how it's done, and the impact it can have, because they have a hell of a a collection there of oral histories from different just people you wouldn't even imagine. So uh, that's where I got that training. So this particular research I wanted to do in an upside down fashion. Usually people go out and get oral histories so, to support some theoretical notion. But what I wanted to do was get the oral histories and then find out what was going on on the new historicist side in terms of the writing that accompanied what these folks actually experienced. And since nobody ever asked, we didn't have any history at all about Lido Road. That wasn't even a thing 
Nobody ever talked about that as a part of World War II. We talked about some stuff happened in Africa and maybe a couple of things in India, maybe. But as far as Black people being in Burma, that never came up, much less the notion of building a road that's a thousand miles long. So I want to get into that, but I, I had to put my thumbs up earlier because I was so taken by how you describe things because in many ways, my my own personal research uh, with veterans intersects with your work. And uh, I come from a theological background. And so the use of hermeneutics, you know, is it, it is parallel in many ways with um, just some of the different things that you're that you're talking about. And I, I was just so excited hearing what you just described. And uh, yeah, that that's so profound. I'm wondering, are you know, because as I was a kid, mentioned to you before, um, I was brought to work one day with my mom, and and you know, I hide people's hats and <laughs> fool around and take their pens and stuff. And my mom said, you know, hang out with uh, I forgot the gentleman's name, but he was an African American gentleman who who worked that they did the same type of work together, uh, administrative work for the city, and um, I just hung out with him. And he had told me that he um, fought in World War II. So you, you've got a picture. I'm I'm about eight years old, so I'm about four years younger than my son. My son's twelve, so I'm I'm sitting in this office and I'm. Here I'm I'm already intrigued by the military in general. And then hearing him talk about, you know, he was mm -hmm. he was in war in Burma, and I'm drawing pictures about him. And mm -hmm. uh, it was just a, a very moving type of thing going on. And I never forgot that experience. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's gotta be because you know, I, I study military history and I know the the first black parachute unit the triple nickels they they were not in in burma i know there i know there were combat units and everything but the central focus of of uh african-american units and, and and correct me if i'm wrong were involved in the Lido road is, is that correct correct yeah and different units had different jobs mm -hmm. some were uh built the air strips Mm -hmm. uh, the combat engineers yep. so they always had guns uh, some built the bases and truck depots mm -hmm. it's a big thing keeping those trucks up because the trucks only went one way okay and they left them in China and they came back by another well, same route because the Lido road only went one way at a time <laughs> right. two, mm -hmm. two, two, two lanes there's one lane right so can you tell yeah. folks what uh -huh. the importance of the Lido Road and the impact in regards to okay. like military history and things like that? I know I got carried away with my personal history as I tend to do at times. So steer <laughs> me back uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the heart of the matter as Don Henley <laughs> from the Eagles saying. Well, well, China was an ally at that okay. time. Mm -hmm. and uh, they needed war materials and they tried to fly them over the hump, the Himalayas, mm -hmm. and uh, it was too heavy. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't get them the supplies they needed. They couldn't go the other way because Japan, right? That's a whole different ball guy. Yeah. So they figured they'd better build a road. And so they started in India, Assam, India, and uh, they built off from there all the way over all those mountains and then into Kunming, China. Wow. That's where the terminus was. Wow. And so it took them, you know, you can imagine the mountains and the um, floods. I had to build bridges. So all of these kind of people had to be trained. Uh, pontoon bridges, they, you know, when they knocked down the Pensacola Bridge over here in Florida, they put in a pontoon bridge. And I was like, oh my God. And it was just one big thing. And I, we, I was like, we're going to go over that. And then it, it just threw me right back to that Lido thing because that's how they built bridges, pontoon mm -hmm. bridges. This, and and this, um, was, this was crucial because the, the Japanese yeah, were in full no. threat into going yeah. into India. They had already beaten 
uh, a lot of the American forces mm -hmm. and British forces. And mm -hmm. so you're saying that there there's this there's this there's this road being built to kind of right. like regain right right that, that. because they had already captured all of the ports right mm -hmm. in the southern part of Burma those were already captured by the Japanese so that's why they had to come across the mountain to get the so, supplies so African over. American troops are not only subjected to the natural uh uh environmental hazards you know mm. M malaria and all that but they're also subjected to like bombing uh uh bombing yeah. well japanese aviation as well as commandos putting right. in uh landmines and things like that and 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 well, other yeah, they, they built those roads out ahead of like troops like merrill's marauders yes so if you're building this road the troops are right behind them coming through mm -hmm. uh so it was just a 24-hour a day operation uh, they would burn oil at night, but they never stopped working. It was twenty. Uh, it was a massive effort. So you've got your bridge builders, you got your truck drivers, you got your construction crew on the ground. Um, you've got your linemen putting up uh, lines for uh, communication. Now you got oil. You got oil pipes coming through, and uh, Miss Lassane will talk about how sometimes the the natives would build a fire <laughs> next to these oil pipes. And of course, that would set that on fire. So now you got to go back in and fix that. But so there were all of these, you had dynamite people. I mean, it was just a massive effort. Um, one of the guys I, I talked to was in charge of uh, the mess hall. And it was muddy, filthy, you know, just couldn't, it rained. Of course, that floods everything. So he and the guys uh, got together and cut down those trees for a floor in this mess hall so it wouldn't be so muddy when they got in to eat or whatever. Um, but just these different ways that the troops um, created answers because they didn't have the right equipment. None of that equipment was right. So they had to figure out how to make it work. So um, there was quite a bit of uh, inventing going on. To get so a lot of people, a oh. lot of people get confused, and you know, being a, a mil military uh, veteran, I guess I served four different times, stretching mm. from like eight, 1986, pretty mm -hmm. much until 2009, and then my final exit as a hybrid person working with the military is 2017. So I've kind of seen the military go through its shifts, but I, I've always noticed that you know, the top people. They kind of have, you know, the vision, right, of of where of where they have to go. But then you have people on the ground, right, figuring like, out a lot how to of make it problems, work. how to get there, right? Right. Well, that, mm -hmm. well, the um, the path there was already a path, a walking trail, okay. and so the thinking was that they would use that walking trail as the guide for the road mm -hmm. just use that to follow through to get into China mm -hmm. but for the road you had to have rock mm -hmm. um, and in order to have rock they didn't have any rock they didn't give so they got the rock out of the bottom of the rivers so right? you can't tell me a general is gonna solve that answer yeah. right it right. was somebody else right yeah Probably. they had to bring it up from there crush it Mm -hmm. But that road would not have stood without having rock on it because it would just have, you know, uh, slid right on in when that rain started. So that had to be an anchor. So they got that soft and on and on and on things like that. Mm -hmm. Always trying to figure it out. And that's that's in, that's incredible innovation. Um, what I what what startles me is that so so much attention ha has been placed on the Lido Road at the same time. Even the military's official black and white uh, film on the Lido Road, who ironically enough is narrated by Ronald Reagan, a young Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and, you know, they talk about the different um, troops, but, you know, it's weird. You know, they'll talk about the Indian troops, the Chinese troops, and they'll show pictures of, you know, all these different troops. But, Rarely in this like hour long video movie, you you don't see American 
African American troops in no. the video, really. And that was purposeful because the guys said that the truck drivers I talked to said that uh, when the road was finished, they brought in all these white drivers to drive the trucks for the movie. And the black guy said, Not today. Mm -mm. Nope. And so they wouldn't let them have the trucks and they drove the trucks in. But this thing of replacing the black guys with the white is a part part and parcel of that whole Jim Crow thing. You can never let people know that they have agency or that they know how to fix things or know how to do that, you know. So it was a it was an it was an incredible effort to can keep that truth out of the um official documents. Right. And then I wanted to also ask you about leadership because I think you, you know. I, just correct me or or lead me because this isn't a show of confrontation. But you know, recently I I saw one of Spike Lee's movie, The Miracle of Santa Anna, and you know I I just you know my my good friend Robert Burke was selected by uh, Spike Lee to to play the racist general General Aldman, who basically said, you know. Uh, uh, African American troops from the 96th, 92nd Infantry into suicide missions, basically, you know. And even towards the end, I, I found uh, uh, oral history clips on, on old men. He never had any remorse, you know, towards uh, what he did. It wasn't just like one or two actions, but deliberate, you know, uh, actions to, to, to make um, tr these troops look bad and so uh the thing is is that we have that example of poor leadership but then i think there's a uh general uh in the leader road project who seems to have a better sense of empathy towards troops um well, is that true or is yeah, that yeah i think what happened lewis pick was in charge right engineer okay. Okay. And he's from the South. Okay. So he probably grew up around Black people. Okay. Um, and one incident that uh, one of the uh, construction engineers talked to me about was they had such a racist um, lieutenant okay. over a particular unit. And he was extraordinarily uh, evil, apparently. Uh, well, one day evening the troops surrounded his tent and sent for pick and they told him we're not working for him so you need to figure something out so pick got rid of him and that's how they handled that mm -hmm. uh they apparent they liked pick mm -hmm. he seemed to be fair to them i didn't have anybody give me any negative comment about them so they they seem to have an affinity for him or, or at least they didn't they didn't hate him right. but apparently he listened to them right and this kind of thing wasn't allowed uh because i mean he depended on them to get that work done i mean this is 24 hours a day he had a schedule to keep and he didn't have time for these people to come from somewhere else with their second lieutenant bars and try to start you know <laughs> controlling the <this. laughs> no right. and then i talked to another gentleman who was in charge of the truck uh, mm -hmm. Lou McCammon, he was out from California, and um, when you look at my website, you'll see him. Uh, he wanted to find uh, the guy who was a captain of one of the truck units, mm -hmm. and uh, he had met the guy I'd been talking to who had the mess hall. They had worked together, mm -hmm. uh, and they had a chance to chat, uh, uh, but he wanted to find the other guys who were in his unit, so I have pictures of those guys with him on the website in case anybody recognizes him. He really wanted to find them. He passed a few years ago, but he really wanted to try to find those guys and talk to him. He was the white commander, right? And of course, all his troops were black, but they all, he always treated them with respect. And so this was apparently a policy maybe coming from Lewis Pick about how folks are going to have to be treated because you're out in the middle of nowhere and you can just drop off the side of a mountain too. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> gonna say this is not gonna be you know the regular downtown kind of situation at the five and ten that's not what this yeah. is and, and the mps are gonna be right there to get you 
one, two, Ain't three, to save you. Yeah. Mm -mm. And these guys, you know, people, we're talking about young people, 18 to 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they're not going to take that. And it's incredible, right? Because it was considered the Lido Road project, like something like almost, it was like an imp an engineering impossibility, right? Like, exactly. like putting all the plannings and, and nobody and wanted power, to the human power and all that, right? It, British uh, didn't want it. Nobody wanted it. They couldn't, they said you couldn't get it done. And the thing is, uh, I did find one, and this is on the website as well. There's one. Um, it's a website, I'm sorry, before you go no, on so that people the, could, could follow. Yeah, lidoroad.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. you'll see a video on there of these African-American troops. So okay. it did exist. It was just back in the, I got, uh, <laughs> at the Florida a and I was in a school of business and you had to go out on an internship every summer mm -hmm. to see what corporate was doing. So you keep up. So they sent me out to California once to um, a, a, the communication center for the army where all their uh, videos and this and that. And one of those investigators said, oh, you're working on, I have this, I have this video of all these black troops on the Lido Road. And I just, I really almost fainted because <laughs> after all that looking around at the archives and all these other places and here, this is sitting there. He said, here, it's like a 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So there are things out there. It's just mm -hmm. that they're buried. Even when I went to the archives to get some of the photographs, they had had them filed just basically on like truck drivers or that, that, that nothing about black people. It wasn't it wasn't filed under African American soldiers at all. Mm -hmm. So you had to go through all of the pictures that were at the CBI. And then just happened to run across these black folks in in the mid. I'm like, why did you, why did you file it like this? Why didn't you just put it under African American? They said, oh, well, they told us to take that apart and put it in there. Da 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 da. I'm like, oh, geez, that would take you months to find, because you have to go through every picture. Right, right. So anyway, um, there are there are some things out there, but they're probably just not discovered yet, buried somewhere, just like that was buried way out in California. And do you think, with with that being said, as far as some of the, um, I don't know, some of the data uh, connected to casualties, fatalities, as well as mm. immigrations, are, are are is that something accessible or inaccessible in your opinion at this point? Well, they claim that the um, building that housed that somewhere in the Midwest burned. Okay. All the they claimed all the files burned with them. Okay. So they don't even, they don't have even like where people were stationed. You it, the unit histories, so which are a zillion of those, you might find a list of people who were in that particular unit, in that unit history. But just to find a person's name, so and so's granddad was in the da 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 da. That's that's not anywhere. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that. That's that's a shame considering such a huge contribution. Do you I think, right. yeah, do you think that the military, the higher command, and do you think politicians and even the president when, you know, because I mean, what, it's estimated that mo more than 60%, and I got this from some of your, your research, 60, what, over 60% served, yeah. you know, African-Americans served to build this road. Did that make an impact at all as far as the the view on uh, African American troops? Yeah, because that's the so what part. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, at the end of the war, they were looking at integration mm -hmm. of the troops, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they set up uh, a committee called it the Gillum Board, and this Gillum was in charge of this organizing this this um, investigation, and uh, General Pick and his aide were on that board. And what they did was call various witnesses, quote unquote, to the um, behaviors and habits of African-American troops in wartime. And so they would call most of the, uh, these people had to come and testify in front of this group. And when you look at the testimony, most of it's very negative. Um, 
people were called cowards and they didn't want to serve, da 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 da. But because Pick had been in charge with these thousands of people, Black people in this isolated part of the world where all those influences from uh, the Western world weren't there, because now you've got these people in this isolated part of the world trying to get something done that the country depended on. Yes. And they worked them so they just worked all the time. So right. most and of the defended case, and defended and held and, arms and right, went on that. convoys mm -hmm. and did you know soldier so soldier things Soldiering. Pro yeah. properly yeah. and and yeah. you know heroically just like any other heroic unit. Exactly. So his presence and his aide's presence mm -hmm. on that board is what turned the testimony they were getting mm. uh, into kind of into shreds because most of that stuff that people were saying that was ne that that was that that racist contingent you were talking about yes. trying to make sure that nothing happened in terms of integration. But because he was there and his aide was, there, they were able to just counteract that, that whole thing. And so the next committee, there was another committee after that, was able to move forward based on what Pick and his aide said. Not so much what these so-called witnesses had to say. So I, in many instances, the PIC people feel as if uh, that committee and his presence on it, uh, uh, that was the main reason that integration happened at all. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that the, the conduct of those folks on that Lido Road uh, made integration possible. Incredible. Incredible. And what were... As far as the the oral histories that you were a part of, that you were able to take, because oral history is so profound as far as pro providing information that, that, you know, that I don't think, I mean, I don't know, I may get well, criticized because you have a business background also, but I don't, I, an oral history goes beyond in many ways a focus group, right? You know, oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, these guys, so. and they, they never met each other. I had, or I talked to them individually. Mm -hmm. So you had one gentleman who was a newspaper correspondent, but he was mm -hmm. also one of the only black war correspondents. He worked for the Pittsburgh Courier. Oh. And so his articles are all in, in there. And it's all about the leader road. It's all about what happened, this and that and the other. It's quite extensive collection. Um, and he was the only reporter, old black reporter in that particular campaign. Um, and then the other, they oftentimes would give you information that wasn't in a book. Like I learned about the hanging from one of the respondents. Um, and it was the only hanging that there was, but apparently one of those uh, officers that you refer to uh, kicked one of these black guys. Well, this guy's from DC. He ain't gonna let nobody kick him, so he mm. shot him. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. shot him. Wow! Uh, and the war was almost over, but they hung him anyway. Mm. And yeah, so, and so that that in many ways, uh, oral history opens up the, the yeah. discourse for this type of information mm -hmm. because out. it wasn't printed anywhere else. All the official documents didn't have it in there, mm. so I was able to get that court uh, the. Um, the court records and all the testimonies and all of that and who talked and who didn't he had a, his people had a lawyer for him which i thought was extraordinary he, he was uh, again he's from dc he was over near georgetown university uh, but i i couldn't get his, to his family but um he had been represented which i was surprised to find that out but they always give you information that you wouldn't have ordinarily had, like that business about encircling that guy, the uh, second lieutenant who was being racist, and yeah. that's not in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and just um, different insights um, about people. For example, Miss Lassane would talk about they bring in those USO people yes. to entertain them, but the nurses had to give up their room mm. for these entertainers. And Miss Lassane was talking about how she used to carve these little soap figurines. Mm -hmm. And when they let one of them entertainers there, the woman took it. <laughs> so, I mean, it was just, you know, I'm like, damn, you know. <laughs> but those are the, those are their memories. 
Yes. Because they had what they call boshes. It's like a little tent slash cabin, but they had mm. their own rooms kind of thing. So you're getting into, you're getting deep, you know, in these oral histories, you're getting deep into their ex direct experiences, their feelings, their thoughts, yeah. something that, that's something uh, much deeper than just a regular old interview or just yeah. uh, opinion just type of uh, yeah. vehicle for information, right? And they needed to talk. They never talked about it before. And, you know, once you get started in oral history, if you just ask a couple of questions, they'll keep going, you know. And uh, I didn't have video for some of them, but toward the end of, I did have video for folks. So that made a big difference. I mean, I have the tapes, you know, how that is, <laughs> get tape stuff. Um, but um, they would talk to me for hours. And did you find after uh, that experience, there was something uh, cathartic, uh, some, some, what, 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 your, what were your impressions like after, you know, uh, them talking about something for one, they were forgotten Two, you know, it, it probably kicked up like a lot of different things in them. What, what, what were a couple of things that you noticed? Well, I noticed that when they all came back, mm -hmm. oh, well, first of all, none of them were bitter. Okay. None of them um, felt, uh, I didn't pick up on any kind of long range anger or any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and when they came back, uh, they were kind of aghast that they couldn't, uh, for example, one wanted to go to law school. He couldn't have black people in that school. So he started his own. Mm -hmm. Now, nine times. His own law it, school? His own law school. <laughs> And That's a lot great. of black, a lot of black folks came through that school. But mm -hmm. had he not been on that road, he might not have been able to have um, enough confidence yes. to think he could start his own school. Yes. But like one of the guys, I found even a man here in, in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. uh, he was. Uh, I did, you know, he just talked to people, and I said, I, I told my banker I was working on this. He said, Lido Road. He said, one of my church members talks about that all the time. <laughs> 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 He's a barber. He was a barber right right near campus, for God's sake. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he said uh, when he came back, he was active in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would say things, the white folks would say to him things like, oh, you're you're going to hell. He said, I already been to hell. Mm -hmm. I was on the Lido Road. I already mm -hmm. know about hell. I'm not going back there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but these mm -hmm. folks were the ones then who would take up the... Um, take up the cross as it were uh on the yes. civil rights movement yes Think and there was that. and there was also i think it was something that you uh contributed or another researcher contributed that i came across where after all of this heroic activity occurred on the way back because it was a, a segregated military what the troops on transport uh ships were mistreated and, and and kind of neglected and just a lot of different things that you know I, it's just important to recognize right we're not we're not kind of like bashing one group or another but it's important to talk about realities right and when you're when you're yeah. experiencing these things they tend to kind of be realities to reflect on so that we can we can change society yeah, you know, Miss Hussein talked about a couple of things and she was traveling to India and of course they didn't have any specific place for her to go. After all, she's a nurse, right? So mm -hmm. um, they didn't have anywhere for her. So they made something up for her, some kind of a wing of a, a hangar mm -hmm. uh, where she had to eat by herself and stay by herself in this room. And she said one day she was there and they marched this prisoner uh a Nazi, uh, they were transporting him someplace, and for whatever reason, they had to cut through this wherever she was staying, mm -hmm. and they were taking him to eat in the cafeteria where she couldn't go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said they marched him right past me, and he was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. And she talks about various times when she reminded the doctor that he had contaminated the field, mm -hmm. and he said, "Don't worry about it," <laughs> you know, stuff like that. She said, "No." You contaminated the field. You got the whatever it was. Mm -hmm. She always was able to speak up. Yeah. But she 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 mentioned that um, 
And she mentioned how, you know, coming back was difficult because she didn't have anybody to talk to about any of this. That's right. They wouldn't have gotten it. Which is true. They would have yeah. never, you know. Right. So, right. but she still knew those key, other key folks who had served over there and they got together. And they, they were still, she took me to see um, the news reporter as well as uh, a couple of other people still in Pittsburgh. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Wow. And when you look at uh, how the Lido road troops are being recognized, what has been done? I mean, nothing. Know. they have um, we had a I was able to convince the Department of Defense through Senator Nelson's office mm -hmm. to give these folks a recognition ceremony. Mm -hmm. So they, Department of Defense came down here and gave it to them and they flew them in, about five or six of them. But I've been trying to convince the uh, Pentagon. They have a, a wing in the Pentagon where African-Americans had served in various wars and this and that. And it was, yes. uh, it's kind of about like a long uh, vestibule, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And I I want them to to put that leader road on, on there as well. You know, some of that stuff is political. It's hard to get. Thank God for Senator Nelson because he was always very supportive. But oh, that's now, great. Yeah, yeah, we have different people here in Florida now, so I don't know who I could get. But I'd like to like them to put that uh, Lido Road on in that um, that little alcove that they have there to commemorate their contribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how many would you say? Um, Lido Road uh, personnel are still living, and uh, is there an organ? Is there a organization or an alumni group still yeah. going? There around? had been one, yeah. There had been one CBI, China mm -hmm. Berber Indian Theater Operation. They used to have every once a year, but they they stopped after there. You know, so many had passed. I, I guess they stopped that in I want to say maybe two thousand and three or four. Okay. Yeah, I used to go to those and sit around and talk with them, but you know, after a while, last one I went to was in Philly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, how how would you say as far as um the children and grandchildren of these veterans, how <laughs> how receptive have have they been? Well, I haven't really talk to too many of them because most of these okay. guys were already in their 70s and 80s yes. when I got to them yes. and they don't they don't some of them don't get it yeah they didn't get it yeah they didn't get it because I got on one of them because when we had the recognition ceremony I really wanted this one guy to get come he was from Baton Rouge he, mm -hmm. he was such a good uh you know he was always so interested but he was sick and I and his son wouldn't bring him mm -hmm. so I told him if you had let me know, I'd have gone to get him and bring him because he wanted to come. So, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. so I don't think they get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most kids mm -hmm. don't get what their parents do. That's true. That is true. You know, that is true. I, I, I think my, my uh, son is light years away from, <laughs> from getting a rack. It's probably when, uh, you know, I'm in that, uh, veteran senior center you know uh -huh. picking, on, picking on doctors and stuff that he's probably <laughs> gonna get it, you know with my cane that's how i yeah. envision myself yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah. you know I, you have to keep reminding i have to remind my son he said come on come on i said hey i'm 74 i'm gonna get there okay don't keep bugging me god almighty i'm coming but i ain't running <laughs> can you wait uh-huh <laughs> Ski this in regards to uh veterans uh and veterans of color what have you noticed like in just your research and in your your understanding within literature and different text um what are just you know just some observations that you make uh, you know i know i know that um was it maya angelo who wrote the the one book on on the on on the Korean War vet or the World War II vet who comes home and has to go through readjustment. I'm I'm not sure, but I I'm just wondering. Um, what are your, I don't know, either personal insights? Have you been 
uh, influence at all uh, from family who served or, or just, you know, things that you've read that, that you know, might enlighten me and, and others? Well, I, I got the impression that these particular guys that I, and women that I spoke to, they, they kind of compartmentalize stuff. Okay. So I didn't get the feeling that what they've been through um, stopped them from moving forward when they got home. Mm -hmm. They just kind of picked up on the things that, that they found that they were um, about. So one guy ended up going back to be speech therapist. That was his thing. Miss mm -hmm. um, Lassane went into public health and she and my mom worked with Dr. Salt. That was way back in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. time. But that's how, that's what they did. That's what she did, public health nurse. And then, uh, like I told you, one gentleman opened his own law school. Another guy went into police work, became, he had been a, he was a singer in a band. You know, they had bands. So he was a singer. It was one of the bands. Mm -hmm. And he moved and went home to Atlantic City and he became a police detective. Mm -hmm. That's what he retired as. So it seemed as if to me that they were able to hone in on what they really seemed to like doing. Mm -hmm. And they they got busy doing that. Mm -hmm. That's um, a great message for the veteran yeah. this day. Yeah, they never. Mr. Sain never talked about the to the war to me. Mm -hmm. Um, in all the years I knew her, I mean, mm -hmm. and I knew her all my life. She never said a mumbling word about it, mm -hmm. which I thought was curious. But uh, probably that's the way the rest of them did. That was then. One gentleman who was a truck driver. Like, you know, 18 year old truck driver driving at night across the Lido Road. I mean, you know, mm. terrifying. Uh, he went back and became a really big uh, pastor at one of the largest churches in Chicago and got to be very influential in community development and whatnot. I mean, he became a really big name, uh, Reverend Brazier. Mm. So, I mean, these folks did all kinds of stuff. It mm -hmm. really did seem like they appreciated the. The life force that they were given and they they um you know probably lost a lot of friends over there because yes. the road took a lot of people they called it a, a man a mile yes because it was yes. just you know you're on the side of a cliff from god knows the road collapses there's no you know yeah. so i think they they came back with a different kind of a world view yes. it wasn't a vietnam kind of thing at all mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. vietnam those guys came back um with a different whole world view altogether. But yes. these guys, I don't know. They didn't, and they never complained mm -hmm. when they talked to me. Mm -hmm. Never talked, you know, they might say a sentence or two about somebody who wasn't whatever, but it didn't seem to stop them from doing what they wanted to do. There's something about, um, I don't know, and this is just my opinion, but there's just something about when you go through something, um, equally you know so i you know i you know for whatever imperfections in the right. i experienced it was still a better a better military than you know when i was in iraq than when i first became i was enlisted and then an officer but it was when i first became an officer in in in, in the 90s they were just or late 80s or early 90s there just weren't young officers who were of color and mm -hmm. uh, treatment was really horrible horrible but then later you know going to iraq with people uh it seemed easier because you know you're going through the same crap together mm -hmm. you know and okay. um i wonder if you know because these uh men and women were together and like you said this isolated place in this very unique special mission which had such a tremendous yeah. purpose if to a certain extent, maybe that helped them in a way with their readjustment, you know, not to minimize the, the invisible, invisible uh, troubles that they experience from war, but being together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, the gentleman who was also the singer for the band, he, he talked about the director of the band mm -hmm. and how isolated he was because he was a mm -hmm. captain. Mm. he's so you're not allowed to fraternize you know yeah, with right. the enlisted people so he couldn't talk to them mm -hmm. 
uh, he wondered how he could stand it, he said. You know, mm -hmm. he's always by himself. He has to eat by himself. He has room by himself. And so I became him. enlisted again. <laughs> <laughs> so he, you know, he wondered about him, but he went on to do a lot in the in the Marine or whatever it was, and mm -hmm. he he made okay. But but they felt very concerned about his welfare because mm -hmm. he was alone all the time, and he he said he remembered that <laughs> they were practicing something, mm -hmm. and uh, the commander of the band walked past, and he mm -hmm. stopped. And he said, oh, that's supposed to be a D flat. <laughs> and he said that he didn't think they were paying, he was paying any attention to them at all. They were like, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> he wasn't in the room with them. But mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. but he did he did feel for his isolation. And yeah. About yeah. 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 Well, what if uh there are some things that you can share with the audience. What are some things that you can share and also different contact information or resources regarding Lolita Road? Because I just find you as a, just, you know, not just the great communicator, but really with your background, just the research that you've done on this is just, just very solid and, and I just I know the people at Coming Home Well was really they were really trying to get you on and really trying to square me away uh -oh. to uh try to make that happen and not blow it and thank you for <laughs> not letting me blow it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So if we can, you know, get some information about you and some some last things about about the Lido Road and any other thing that you may have in mind for us? Well I'm I'm still trying to figure out how to publish all this information because okay. it all it all kind of connects together. It's just I mean I could probably put an article out there, but I mean I've done that. It doesn't that doesn't get to the people. What I'm trying to do is figure out how to get the information to as many people as possible. And I and as economically possible, you know. I mean, they have those coffee books, but they're like seventy five dollars. So I just want something that people can can look through and and appreciate and uh, have some baseline information about how um, this country has been um, uh, uh, propped up and supported by African Americans from the beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, that continues. And it's a, a very rich history of, uh, of sacrifice and uh, um, that as we move through all these other things at the end of the day, uh, African-Americans in this country have uh, paid the price to have full citizenship and any other thing they want. <laughs> but I, I think people don't know enough about what has happened in the past and how that information has been withheld really. Uh, and we need to just kind of catch up. So my, uh, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how to get that out there. So the website has a good bit of information to just kind of give you a baseline of what's there and what it looks like. Um, so, you know, and as a researcher, stuff is interesting to me that might not be that much of uh, uh, something to somebody else, but I like to look at the maps <laughs> and yeah. stuff like that, just because the work that went into um, getting these folks from point A to point B is is amazing in terms of uh, all the just all the effort that went into getting this road built and getting these folks where they needed to go and help, you know, getting the equipment to them. And then, the, you know, you've got your tigers, you've got your snakes, you've got the this, you've got malaria and on and on and on. I mean, it was, it was a hell of a, a site. Uh, it was an incredible campaign. Uh, I had a chance to give a paper in Kunming. And mm -hmm. so we were able to travel that little part of the road that was still there. Wow. Uh, so, and it was just real curvy, <laughs> just mm -hmm. like we would have imagined it. And uh, they didn't have any, any paint on the road, but what they would do is, um, it was all brick, a brick road at that point, because this was back in 04, but the road was all brick, but it, it had to divide the lanes, they would set the brick upright. Mm -hmm. 
And so you would have flat, flat, flat on the lanes, but in the middle, they had these upright bricks that went all the way down the middle. So you'd know which side of the road you're supposed to be on. But that was original to, to the road because they didn't do anything to it on the China side. It's the Burma side that you can't get through. Mm. But in uh, India, that's Lido, India, that it's, it's still there too. And it's still the only um, land line between India and China wow. is the is this Lido Road. The Burma Road's been, you know, that was closed off by the Japanese. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this Lido Road is the only land line between that India across the Himalayas and on into Kunming. Wow. Yeah. I I really appreciate the detail in all that you say. And again, I am going back to the website after oh, this yeah. conversation and so lidoroad.org is that that yeah the, the, i have okay. one of the guys on there and he i let put some of his oral history on there not a whole lot just so you could hear his voice and you can see the picture of when he was a singer and then when i met him <laughs> when he was in atlantic city that's mm -hmm. kind of fun yeah Lovely. yeah well thank you so much dr c oh, and you. i really appreciate your presence and we would definitely like you to um, come up again. I'm, I have another podcast, Veteran, et cetera. And in the future, maybe if you have time and I don't screw things up, we can <laughs> get you uh, uh, on there, you know. But so far, you know, I'm one and oh, you know. Of course um, you are. It's very good. You. You're good at this. Yeah. Did, did you enjoy this? I love this. And yeah. Yeah, don't do I me any favors it. because, <laughs> you know, my producer, you know, she knows, she knows when I'm lying and dying and usually I'm <laughs> doing both. So thank it was you. fun. It was great to be able to go back and I haven't talked about it in a while. You know, you, you put something down for a while and you pick up something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so it gives me, um, maybe people ask enough questions that I'll be able to figure out how to get all this stuff to them. <laughs> yes, and I will. I will try to present uh, some of this, maybe with you in in the future. You know, there's different conferences happening, and I think you're right. I mean, I think to get the word out in different ways, because it's not like this stuff is defensive or offensive. It's just facts, and it's just facts. It's a part of American history. It's not an it, a, a special yeah. type of history, but it's. It's American yeah. history. It's military history. It's definitely, you know, African American history. But it's it's history. It's real, you know. And right. I just think people would benefit from it. I think they'll be interested. They, you know, sometimes when I was teaching, I would always get my kids to interview their grandparents, and they always found out something new. So I think you know, sometimes people have to ask the grandparents stuff and see what they know. You never you never know because some you know unless you ask. Older people sometimes they don't even think, but they're they know is important. But I think uh, they may have some information that their parents gave them. You never know. Mm -hmm. well, but if people have questions, there's a link. There's a link on there. Just you know to type in whatever questions okay. you have, and mm -hmm. I'd be happy to answer if I have the answer. And she she'll answer it. Believe me, I you know <laughs> she's been fully vetted and uh, <laughs> and. and, and <laughs> and I'm even tempted on not putting her in, 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 in my research to claim it. Now I'd never do that. It's it's so it's so good and reads so well that uh, you know it's just it's just a godsend, you know. Because I you know I I've been trying to do this, and you definitely give um, you know in, in 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 patrols. There's always the the point man, point person, point woman you know, ahead, you know, and you just, you know, when you presented this whole thing on Leader Road, I was like, wow, this is a great template to go about understanding these these mm -hmm. different micro historical tremendous uh, events in our history and to do it the way you set it up. Well, I appreciate that. And I think your, your uh, topic of coming home well is uh, a really vital conversation that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. um, so many of our, our um, enlisted and officers and, and veterans have been uh, 
they've not been able to, I guess, amalgamate all these things that happen. Yes. yes. And um, I think it'd be important for them to know that others have figured out a way to get that done without having any huge traumas, but they've been able to figure out, uh, and maybe some of these stories that these folks have it would be of help to them to see yes. how others have done it before them. Yes. With way less resources. Yes, and the way um, that I'm going to go back to some of your uh, oral history work with these vets, it'll give me um, insight as far as working with okay. the vets that I'm working with. So yeah. I thank you so much. Yeah, I thank you so much for your trailblazing work. And uh, <laughs> until we meet again, I don't say goodbye because okay. <laughs> you are definitely our friend here at Coming Home Well. And uh, we really appreciate you, doctor. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and uh, I appreciate you guys finding me. And, Thank you. Uh, offering the invitation. It's, it's great. And I think it's a, such important work you're doing. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's <laughs> it for uh, VOC, Veterans of Color. And uh, join us next month for our next topic that we will be engaging because, you know, we need to look at readjustment from many different angles and the historical and cultural is just a very important face to look at to kind of like rebuild the stories and rebuild the lives uh, affected by the military and war in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Veterans of Color invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, it would be appreciated if you share the podcast with others. Give a like, post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veterans of Color, check out the site cominghomewell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. Veterans of Color invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, it would be appreciated if you share the podcast with others. Give a like, post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veterans of Color, check out the site cominghomewell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. Veterans of Color invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, it would be appreciated if you share the podcast with others. Give a like, post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veterans of Color, check out the site cominghomewell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thanks for tuning in.